and I was pleased to, around about the age of 14 or 15, <coughs> meet Sid, who I'd sort of noticed in the street anyway, as you would, because uh, he lived so close by. And um, his school was a few hundred yards from my school. And what we're going to, um, I have a feeling that what we will um, be getting into this afternoon is um, the way in which uh, networks of friends um, help support and develop certain sets of ideas. They incubate those ideas, we could say. Uh, there's certainly, um, ne I'm going to call them, ladies and gentlemen, networks of intensification. If at any point there are any questions, if the vocabulary becomes too Latinate, let me know. And um, we can discuss these terms. Uh, there were many people who used to see each other all the time, boys and girls, with very many common interests. And uh, uh, this, this had a, an immensely powerful, powerful incubatory effect. Um, one wonders at times what difference, if any, it made that this business to which I refer emerged in Cambridge. <coughs> The reasons, the two reasons I think why it's worth pausing here until we have to move on, um, uh, namely that one is that um, Dad Storm's father was um, a communist and Vanji uh, was um, extremely bohemian. And of course the further back you go through the 20th century, being a bohemian becomes more and more unusual and more and more a strong side of independence. Um, and uh, Vanji had a or maybe still has, I don't know, a pottery in the back garden where she used to throw pots. She was, she was compared to some of our parents in this peer group, very, very liberal. We could do things here that we weren't allowed to do in our parents' houses. So after the pubs, some of which I spoke about to some of you on the last tour, the Criterion, notoriously in the centre of town, no, no longer there, we would simply walk across Christ pieces to Storm's house around about 11 o'clock, something like that, go up to his room and lie on his bed and smoke cannabis and read Marvel comics. And, um, but, and also uh, discuss the issues of the day, which were sort of loosely tied up with um, the emerging, the rapidly emerging, surging uh, alternative culture. Um, we've, nobody obviously, could say, yes, we are in the middle of an emerging alternative culture, although you could a bit later on. There was certainly an upwelling of um, kind of the need to not be quite so uh, conformist in one's behavior. The school that I went to, for example, in common with many, I'm sure, um, believed that the boys should conform. And um, it's an old-fashioned word now. It was a, it was a, a word that uh, caused schoolboys and schoolgirls a great deal of irritation because they were always being told not to be non-conformist. Um, conform, boy, uh, was the sort of thing they used to say to you. Um, and uh, that kind of culture, uh, the also the culture which made you go into the Army, Navy or the FS Air Force on Monday afternoons if you went to a certain sort of school with the combined cadet force, was like a sort of intensified version of school with uniform, with a different uniform, and they used to shout louder. Um, mercifully, uh, one's enlistment in the cadets only lasted three hours per afternoon. I personally learned how to fire a gun and kill a man. Very, very useful. I've done it several times <laughs> since, but just between the people in this bus, okay? I feel as though we're all friends and I can say things like that. I don't expect to be grasped up later. Huh? <laughs> um, uh, Vanji, uh, had no truck with that sort of thing whatsoever. She, as I said, was marvellously open. One felt that um, one could behave as one wanted in Vanji's house. You really didn't have to sort of put on the thing that you put on when you meet your friend's pair uh, output, particularly the cow, for example. Uh, back view of a cow with a cow looking around into camera and maybe the most famous, and there are half a dozen others that even people who don't give a damn about the Pink Floyd might, of a certain age, might well recognize as having struck them in the street, as it were, some time ago. Um, and um, uh, Storm's done Led Zeppelin and uh, Paul McCartney and all kinds of other people, but it's the Floyd work that really stands out because he was able there to be at his most surreal, that's his taste. For Paul McCartney, for example, had a limit to how surreal he wanted his iconography to be. So, um, although Storm 
would pitch ideas to Paul. Paul would tend to reject the ones that were too far out, whereas um, the ones, his most far out ideas for the Pink Floyd were invariably accepted. Um, it, the Floyd would say that um, Storm hectors people so thoroughly when he's pitching his work that it's almost a relief just to say yes because uh, at least it stops him talking in an insistent adenoidal voice. Um, but I've known him since 14 and I can forgive him his manner. Many people can't. I don't care. His adenoidal voice is due to his falling face down a raspberry cane when he was nine and the cane went up his nose and altered the way he spoke for the rest of his life. Um, yes, uh, we're now grinding through this little medieval town at the speed at slightly less uh, speed than they probably did in the olden days uh, when there were only horses and carts. I don't know why they don't... In, uh, have they got any kind of congestion scheme in Cambridge? They're about to try and introduce, Sorry? They're about to try and introduce something. It's not yeah, really I mean, it does work. Um, the shops all grumble, and then they, you know, they get used to it. And you have to supply an awful lot of car parks, but there seem to be quite a few already. Still, you haven't, as I've said earlier, you haven't come here to hear me, just taking advantage of the fact that you can't stop me going on about car parks. I mean, you paid money for this. Some bloke gets on the bus, claims to be the tour guide. Oh, you don't even know that I am the tour guide. I could have just noticed this bus here. I realised that I'd seen a few of you at some of these talks and I thought, hmm, try it on. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but, you know, who wants to get on a bus with a strange bloke and listen to him going on about the congestion charge? <laughs> you can get pamphlets about that if you're really sad and read them in your home. <laughs> so this is the magnificent house that Gilmore grew up in. Can I interrupt? Sorry. Please do. The, the owners say that the porch wasn't there in the 60s, so it has been added since. Oh, right. It's, it's quite a nice little addition, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, it's, it's fitting. You were there. Yeah, my early days there, the first school was up to the Catholic Church. They moved up under a good friend of Paul's and mine who lived down here. A lot of people lived in this small area. Um, Paul Charrier, as I, I hope not to bore you, so I'll get through it quickly because some of you have heard this story was taking LSD, he went to the toilet, he found a book called Yoga and the Bible, he opened it, he discovered that in India there was a guru who would get you off the wheel of free incarnation after four incarnations if you were to do the following things, give up meat, give up drink, give up drugs, get married, get your hair cut, get a job and blend in. And then for two and a half hours every morning you're supposed to meditate using a particular personal mantra given to you by this guy. This guy wasn't one of these giggling Maharishi guys, he was a respectable Guru, as there are many, many of them in India, and nobody thinks it's weird. Um, but um, it certainly broke out with down the middle, and Sid was sort of marooned across the fence, insofar as I think he was quite interested in the master. Some of us weren't. I am, because genetically speaking, I've had my genes tested, and there are no spiritual genes in me, which is why I've never had a spiritual experience ever. So, so you could ask the master if you were ready to you know, be initiate, initiated into his following. And Sid went along, saw the master. The master looked at Sid and said, No, you're not ready. And Storm Forbes has always said that he thinks this was a major breaking point for Sid. Um, because many friends were standing in festooning in toilet paper. Um, putting the master's car in completely impossible places to get out of. Going down to the sister school, the Cambridge High School for Girls, and sawing down all their goalposts. And indeed sawing down the memorial tree. This was the sort of thing that Roger Waters in particular and Seamus O'Connor were just up to. They would sit back and think, how can we wreak the most damage upon this school that we find so tedious? Um, and they used, to have, they used to have nights of immense vandalism. We can regard this as... These, came, you know, lads from rather good families who live by breaking the stereotype of the kind of people who you expect to do that kind of thing. Nothing of the sort. These were naughty boys. Um, and um, my school is 400 yards from here. And they used to call, because it's the Perth School for Boys, the day before, not attended, they used to call it, used to call us the Percy Pigs. And uh, we used to call them 
if you'll excuse me for a moment, lapsing into Portuguese, the county county. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they used to live there with uh, several Barrett brothers and Rosemary, now Rosemary Green. Uh, Rosemary Green, who's effectively blessed this festival uh, by allowing it, by giving it her blessing, saying she doesn't mind because she's been extremely, extremely protective of Sid, quite rightly, for 30 years or more. Uh, when he first came back, legend has it, and I really don't know if this is true, but after leaving the Earl's Court, he walked back to Cambridge. I don't know if that's true. Yeah, um, uh, at that point, if he did walk, he would have been walking with his thousand yards stare and his tousled hair full of powdered mandrakes and bags and black bags under his eyes. He was in a solid state, although he would have been wearing velvet trousers and a floral jacket. He knew where he needed to be, which is where the only place presumably he felt safe. And when his parents passed away, I think when his dad died, that was held to be also quite difficult for him. I don't know if he was for anybody. Um, sort of thing people say when searching for some kind of analysis of his condition, but then everybody's dad does die. So. Only in Cambridge could there be a type of person who rides uh, a very upright bicycle with a basket very slowly. I imagine the same as in Oxford. Um, and who looks a bit kind of wrapped up in things, frankly. Cambridge was, and maybe still is, full of figures like that. Uh, probably extremely powerful and influential people within their field of research. It's quite sweet, really. Um, I, I quite like seeing it. Um, that was the house. It had a basement. It had a, yes, it had a basement. And on one occasion, we were around Sid's house. Uh, William Pryor, who was, uh, you may have seen talking and reading recently, was there, as was Nigel Lesmond Gordon. And um, they were just hanging out, as we usually did. And uh, William thought he would hypnotize uh, Nigel's girlfriend, Anne. And, um, which he did, by swinging a watch in front of her face, um, in, the, in the cellar, as we all crowded round. And uh, he couldn't get her out of the trance. Um, he said, you will come round when I snap my fingers, but she wouldn't. She was zonked out, and this, things got rather um, uh, tense, because we, we didn't really have the, um, the technique or the knowledge. Uh, so we tried slapping her, and things like that, and shaking her, and shouting. And, uh, you know, one should never talk about the jokes one has made in the past, but I will share with you, ladies and gentlemen, that I went upstairs, I um, walked up the the staircase and the loads of people at the party looking down as I came up anxiously because they knew what was happening so um, I said it's a boy um, anyway uh, they got her out of her trance and uh, it just shows how silly young people can be that's all I have to say um, but um, this was just wild teenage party stuff I can't uh, much, um, Sid's mum Gwyn Winifred was a pleasant uh, elderly lady, or she seemed elderly back then, when one was only 18 or something. Uh, and uh, she too seemed to be quite permissive, but not in a bohemian way, but more in that sort of rather vague wife of academic kind of way. But, you know, uh, relatively liberal. Um, so there's another figure. There are all these liberal mums that we keep coming up against. The dads don't seem to picture in this analysis so much, but. Um, they do kind of permit a sort of, when people, when boys and girls congregate in each other's houses, um, what they can get away with is going to determine how their values um, develop and subsequently, I would think. So Sid's was another one where, you know, you go into Sid's room, which was on the left-hand side of the front door, ground floor room. I remember going in there lots, him sitting on the bed, either painting, rather well, I thought, the painting in the uh, current exhibition that most resembles the work that I used to see in Sid's room was the uh, the, um, the canvas towards the back of the gallery in a sort of orangey red with uh, fabric worked into the surface and oil paint applied very, very thick, um, which probably showed the influences of American pop painters that he was interested in. And then he would pick up his uh, six-string metal guitar and play plectrum style. And he would be playing, um, you know, Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry, and a bit further on, down the line, Bob Dylan, somewhere. <coughs> I have a torn off piece of cardboard where he's written the chords to Oxford Town by Bob Dylan. It's probably worth a hundred thousand pounds a piece of cardboard. 
nice bit of wood uh, before, the, uh, before it rots away. Um, yes, uh, so um, Sid, could, Sid could more or less treat that room as his studio. Uh, and his friends would go in there and not be sort of swept up or into the business of the house or um, you know, get any feeling of being surveilled. Um, one of uh, Sid's close friends who went to the school of the road, Paul Charrier, I think is a very, very important figure because uh, he, uh, he comes from probably a more lower middle class family if we can be obsessive about these things. Lived in this street where the houses are a little bit smaller. A uh, bit down, uh, about 20 houses down on the right um, was the, the house of the Charriers. I don't know if you've read On the Road by Jack Kerouac, but um, in it, it is a fictionalization of experiences he had when hitchhiking with his friends. And uh, there's a figure in it called um, Dean, Dean Moriarty. And Dean is seen by the nar narrator, who is the cell of paradise, who is Kerouac's alter ego in this fictional work. Um, uh, Sal thinks that Dean is the most extraordinary person he's ever met, the absolute unfettered embodiment of the life force. Um, ne Neil Cassidy in real life and Jack Kerouac were hitchhiking together. Neil was an amphetamine user which may have contributed towards his consistently manic behaviour. But he was, Neil for Jack Kerouac was a very, very kind of uh, released, open person. One senses that despite the fact that Jack mm. Kerouac is seen as the kind of king of the beats, he in turn was actually only, the way he became famous was through his admiration of somebody who was far more out there than himself. Um, and I think that Paul Charrier, who, who was a jolly tubby boy, uh, with national health, round national health spectacles and curly hair, who always looked ill at ease in a school uniform, um, but had an immensely jolly, noisy quality. What you saw was what you got. He was very unironic. He didn't take the piss. He was supportive and warm. As it, and he shared, therefore, certain characteristics with Sid. They were both rather jolly people. And they all had an immense capacity for him, having a good time. And when the beatnik thing, when boys left school and went into the beatnik thing, uh, there was a house in Clarendon Street, adjacent to Earl Street, where we were earlier, near Storm's house, where all the, the beat boys and girls moved in, and where they could do exactly what they, were, want, what they wanted to do, because there were no mothers or fathers there at all. This was the first time they'd lived anywhere other than in their parents' homes. And uh, Paul Charrier was the person who I mentioned, who went to India first of all, became uh, obsessed and filled with the uh, spiritual force of what the person they call the master, and came home and such was the power of his evangelism that he persuaded William Pryor, Michael Gordon, Andrew Rawlinson and lots of other people um, to go to India and to get initiated. Um, but I think in the same way that Emo from uh, another class and from across the tracks would kind of really sort of like irradiate the group of his presence, so would Paul, a very, very powerful figure. Um, who, when he came back from India, cut all his hair off, bought a grey suit and became rather dull, uh, tragically. Because uh, I was very close to him and I felt as though I'd lost a friend. But then, in, in much the same way, you could say that people felt that they'd lost, that Sid, in a sense, was dead, although he lived for 30 or 40 years. Many of us never saw Sid for 40 years, and it was more or less as if he were dead. <coughs> it was very sad to hear that he actually died, but it wasn't the shock of bereavement that you might expect had you been seeing him regularly, because nobody saw him regularly, not from his sister at all. Um, so, Brian, if you could, could you take us, we'll just go down Blinko Grove, please, and we'll pass this house. I'm not quite sure what number it is, but I'll pretend I do by chemist. Um, yeah, the Trim family did there, she was an only child, very, very pretty, all us lads thought she was ever so pretty, <laughs> and she used to go to the county girls' school over there. And um, uh, they grew up opposite each other, they fell in love, and uh, they, I don't sure think they got married, but they were lived as man and wife in New North Road in Islington for a long time. And then this result, Roger went off with a groupie or two. Um, 
that, was, that would be the last normal house that Roger Waters owned, the one in London. And Judy was a potter, like Storm's mum. And she had, uh, she in the back garden of their house in Islington, because Roger was so well to do, had a beautiful uh, pottery based studio in a shed with all the proper equipment. Judy Trim very sadly died about eight years ago. Roger didn't go to the funeral. Rock stars don't go to people's funerals. A lot, God knows why. Um, possibly his third wife wouldn't let him. Um, but um, Judy died, it was thought, through working throughout her life with various glazes um, that she used in her pots. She actually became quite a prominent and respected potter at the point where you know, craft becomes art, a debatable zone. And she was certainly a well-respected potter. The glazes that she was wanting to use day after day, year after year, were deemed a bit too late and online when health and safety got developed to be very dangerous and the potters should wear masks and she never did and it's highly probable that that's what uh, gave her some fatal lung condition from which she died and she's only she was barely into her fifties probably leaving behind her, her son that she'd had with her first husband because she wasn't married to Roger but anyway this is childhood sweetheart city here and um, uh, one of those extraordinary relationships that one often feels perhaps are doomed because the person you meet when you're 15, you, most people regard that as something that has a, you know, a certain shelf life um, and rarely goes on into adult years. But on the other hand, other people might regard it as the ideal basis for a relationship I mean, that open laziness when you haven't paid money to hear me uh, a penny at the time in which people conduct their lives. resembled a bit Judy Trim's house in the previous street on the Rock Road. And um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's 400 yards from Rosemary. And it's, a, it's an ideal kind of thing. Well, Rosemary then uh, was in the parental house, but then she, I think, did she get married? She yeah, that's it. And she, I don't know if she sold up 183 Hills Road, but it's where she was there. That's yeah. not my impression. I don't know where his sister no, is. I think his mother sold Hills Road and moved him to this house. Yeah, the yes. where at which and point Rosemary is completely an adult and I expect to purchase the house. But I, I, it must be quite close because the whole point was, that, although she didn't want to live with him, she wanted him, she wanted to be close because she was, you know, this guardian figure. Uh, and she said that. Um, so she lived alone. Yes, absolutely alone. Um, and uh, yes, and oh, it, she says, I, and uh, the author says, I've got a note for you, which he had from some one or other. It said, just did he even take it? No, he didn't even take it. He just so the guy had to leave it outside. Sid wasn't uh, quite capable of it. Not be, you know, nobody could bully their way in. He wasn't that afraid. The French journalist did once manage to find the 183 Hills Road address and took a photographer. And so there is a fairly late period photo of Sid looking rather puzzled. Uh, at the door of the 183 Hills Road, there were a few incidents like that and a few snatched photographs of an increasingly tubby and baldy rather unsexy looking ex rock star wandering around Cambridge, but that would have worried him, because as far as I can gather from Rosie, um, he never talked about it, and uh, he didn't want to think about it, he didn't want to be reminded about it in any way. David Gilmore uh, was careful to make sure that Storm, that um, Sid's uh, royalties were always in place, uh, as you can imagine. Floyd are among a handful of groups whose back catalogue is never, ever, ever out of uh, distribution. And I'm told that every single album just stonks along, some more than others, obviously, but 
has a back catalogue to be associated with, particularly as a songwriter, because he wrote the entire of the first one, uh, kept things very comfortable. So, one imagines he could have bought out some grass and meadows, but um, he didn't. He wanted something simple. And he was keen on gardening. And he apparently used a cycle to shop to get the newspaper, cycle to the pub, play darts, have a beer, simple life as described to me by Rose. Um, and they had normal everyday conversations. I, you know, I can't tell you things like that without thinking that um, it is as if he were pretending you know, that he was so frightened of something as a result of, as a result of all the things that people talk about, drugs and rock and roll and fame, that he decided to manufacture a personality that was a tiny fraction of what he once was. That's just my opinion. I have absolutely no way of proving that whatsoever. If you're sufficiently frightened of something, so frightened that you think that if you start to resemble it in the least, that it's going to happen again, then you, the idea of actually pretending as a lifetime project lasting over 30 years, pretending to be another kind of person, altogether uh, might be attractive. On the other hand, the whole thing is that um, he may, as I said in my talk the other day, brain damage. Simple, well, I don't know if the word simple is correct, but it may be over a period, not in one go, but it may be over a period that certain mechanisms, uh, certain systems in the brain were put out of balance and simply could not recuperate. Well, I suppose the most extreme example of brain damage would be where tissues themselves are actually damaged. And that would be even worse. But once there's any level of brain damage that's distinct from bad psychological problems, then there's nothing that can be done. You can't go in there and stitch it up again. It's just not possible. That's what you're left with. So, instead of his inventing a personality to get through those years, perhaps that was his personality. And perhaps he regarded his earlier self as a, an odd memory. Uh, he would, perhaps he knew it was him, and perhaps he knew that if he thought about it too much, it made him feel very uneasy, which kind of proved it was him. Uh, but um, I don't know, it's the same, these ideas, <clears throat> when you put them in a Hollywood movie with Betty Davis in them or something like that, they become the stuff of kind of spooky films, <laughs> whereby. Um, you imagine um, this rather kind of intimidating figure with a stare, kind of inhabited by the ghost of his former self and keeping it at bay all the time. Or else you imagine something far sadder and much less exciting, which is, you know, the bloke who damaged his brain. Uh, and thanks to Rosie's careful protection, he was able to put together a very, very ordinary life. I mean, he didn't have a job, he didn't need a job, and we know that he liked continue to like painting. Some of the paintings from the last period are quite ordinary, like pleasant watercolours which show skill. You know, he hadn't lost the skill. I mean, you get with brain damage, you get people who can still play the piano, or something like that. You know, people who used to be great pianists have terrible accidents, but they can still play the piano, sort of thing. I don't know, maybe, so maybe he lost some faculties and uh, not everything. It's completely open, you know. There weren't any psychiatrists and psychologists taking notes as all this was going on. So you've got the opinions of people like myself. And that's about it, really. What does Rosie say? I don't know. I think Rosie, Rosie's objective seems to be to stop this kind of speculation. Why are you all so interested? This was 40 years ago, she says. If you were to ask a <coughs> question like that, you'd get that response, even now. I mean, I saw her the other night at the happening. She, I hadn't seen her in 14 years. She's ever so jolly. And she, she's allowed to be now. She doesn't have to be the severe guardian anymore. And I just got a, I saw her for a minute and said, how'd you do, nice to see you. And she was ever so jolly. Um, maybe she always was, even in the severe years, but she would never let you know that, because her job was to do this, you know, non-stop. Uh, but when I have pressed her about it, 
because I rang her once or twice and rather forcibly reminded her that I didn't used to be good friends with Sue and therefore she suggested or implied that she could trust me. Um, she did, she would talk about the average day in his life but um, uh, she wasn't going to be drawn on any psychological analysis. You could tell it really annoyed her. Um, maybe she found it distressing, maybe she knew things, maybe she knew of a fragility in this whole setup that she had to keep the cork on, I, I, I really don't know. Uh, well, these, they're all interesting. That was all it was implied though, wasn't it? Which? Well, that he was, he was quite fragile and therefore his way of coping with his life as it was, was to shut it out and just, just lead this very, very simple life on a day-to-day yeah. -day basis. I wonder how much energy it takes on a day-to-day -day basis to keep doing this all the time throughout your life, Stop pushing things away suppressing uh, great suppressing things that remind you suppressing things in the outside world that remind you of the past and suppressing ideas and thoughts and memories that may come in I would have thought it was quite exhausting like um, you know comedians who can't stop being funny people like that you know and you think oh, it's exhausting on a daily basis Peter Sellers the, for example he couldn't stop it he couldn't turn it off I remember seeing an interview with him where he admitted he'd forgotten what his voice was like. Because he spent 23, 23 hours a day he was putting on funny voices. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if Sid experienced any kind of similar sort of exhaustion at maintaining something. God knows. I'm repeating myself now, but I'm just, you know, I still think about that. Uh, what, they, what the truth of the matter was. And of course, I'm pitching it as though it was either this or that, and it could well have been a, a mixture of too much drugs and they exacerbated inherent psychological potentials that maybe many of us have got but we never have to learn about. I mean, LSD is so powerful. Kids that take ecstasy now, um, ecstasy is relatively mild and the doses that people took, they are shocking to even people of a later generation who take LSD. People used to take 500 micrograms big for LSD, and, and this, uh, you know, doctors who work with LSD in a controlled therapeutic situation give less than a hundred, you know, that's quite enough, thank you very much, to loosen people up, in the same way that doctors used to work with ecstasy, loosen people up, making them more amenable to psychotherapeutic conversation, but the kids in those days, God knows who said, it's like, you know, you go into a country where you don't drink pints, all pubs serve beer in five pint glasses, right? And for some reason, uh, LSD was served in these giant doses. And everybody thought that was normal. Just a storm. Hanging out there for a bit, and again, all the way back again. <coughs> Off to work. Um, and I imagine that too. Brain must find that immensely difficult to handle more than you know once every now and again. It's not built for it really. But uh, you know, with, with the very charismatic and fairly consistent influence of Timothy Leary from over the other side of the Atlantic, a charming man, a good-looking man, a charismatic man, who made it all sound terribly, terribly attractive. This business of you know, taking LSD. It was powerful enough to make you see through society. You think, fuck, I don't have anything to do with this. This is just a charade. This is all pretense. Uh, and um, so let's just walk away. And as I said earlier this week, hundreds of thousands of kids walked away. Um, and uh, some of them walked back again. Um, a, a tiny handful, I think, would probably encounter uh, a sort of complete inability ever to touch the ground again. It's not the case, in my view, that if you take a load of acid, you will be fucked up. It's what you take into the experience with you, I, I imagine. It's some uh, an enviable stability that uh, endures. And there's an awful lot of melodramatic talk about you take this and it will melt you. Uh, but actually, some people took it, it melted them, and then they came back again. Perfectly all right. Most people, in fact.
Чего ты так, чем-то?